Baker, then we'll go to you. Sure. And then we'll leave it open for some questions. I think I have some slides in the middle of the... Yeah, I moved them. I moved them a little bit towards the end. Oh. But Ricky, should, do you want me to do the whole... Good evening. Or... Good evening. Welcome to Spine Time. Doc, Dr. Singh, please go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you, Jessica. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our May edition of our Spine Time webinar series. Uh, today is going to be an exciting talk on the soft tissue sources of back pain. For most of you, this is not your first time joining us, uh, but just telling you a little bit about our center. We pride ourselves on being interdisciplinary and comprehensive in nature, focusing not just on interventional and surgical approaches, but also some of the non-traditional approaches, including rehabilitation and muscle medicine and neurology and acupuncture and integrative health. So uh, this talk is certainly in line with those topics. And the reason we kind of chose this topic today was, you know, many times patients come in with an MRI highlighted and annotated and x-ray saying, you know, I have disc degeneration or stenosis. Am I going to be walking in five years? And really, we put a lot of emphasis on things we see on pictures and structural things. And sometimes we don't put enough stress on mechanical issues and soft tissue. So today we're going to talk to both Dr. Roger Hartle, who is the director of spine surgery here at Walt Cornell Ox Spine, uh, and Dr. Norman Marcus, who is the director of the Norman Marcus Pain Institute, who really specializes in clinical muscle pain research and is going to give us a very interesting perspective on the things that he sees in clinical care and how we can manage that. Uh, so I'll start with Dr. Marcus. Go ahead and introduce yourself if you don't mind and tell us a little bit about what you're going to share with us. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about how soft tissue or muscle tendons and ligaments may be the source of pain in your back and actually uh, represent most of the back pain that people experience. For example, in this study, um, they found that at uh, three months, the source of back pain in 85% of patients who were presenting with back pain was coming from soft tissue, uh, described as nonspecific back pain, meaning sprains and strains of soft tissue. Um, the next slide, um, despite the fact that most back pain is coming from muscles, the guidelines from the United Kingdom, uh, from it's called the NICE or National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and from the United States American College of Physicians and the American Pain Society, in their guidelines to treat back pain, there's no mention of muscle as the source to evaluate or to treat. Next slide shows us that essentially what we're looking at is the skeleton absent all the soft tissue as the source of pain. So the pain just comes from the joints in the, in the bones of your back and the, um, the nerves that exit from the spine, this bony spine, without looking at the soft tissue at all. In the next slide, we see that if we cover the skeleton, we have layers upon layers of muscle, indeed 320 paired uh, uh, muscles, one unpaired for approximately 641 muscles in the body. And it represents 45% of the body by weight. Um, actually, if we look at the, 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 the muscles that we may uh, identify on a physical examination, this is in the upper body. The next slide is the muscles that we see in the lower body. And the next slide are the muscles that we see in the arms and legs. So we can see that there are many, many reasons for the pain that you may have um, aside from pain coming from your spine itself. And the next slide uh, shows us the um, interest that we have at Cornell, unique amongst most universities in the world, where we're actually concerned and curious about what are all the reasons that people may have back pain. So the neurosurgical service, um, uh, their fellows and myself did a literature review and we reviewed 2,700 articles on pain that existed in patients who had successful back surgery. So the surgery looked great, but the patient still complained of some pain. 
So we looked at all of these articles that address that problem, sometimes called fail back surgery syndrome or, or post laminectomy syndrome. And we found of all the articles, 2,700 articles, only five mentioned muscles as the source of pain. So we can see it's a real problem that it's being ignored generally in the world, not at Cornell. Next slide. Dr. Marcus. Yes. Maybe a quick question. I, I think it's interesting and obviously that's something that we deal with on a daily basis, but maybe, maybe it would be interesting to explain historically, why is it that medicine in general and, and people just don't think or don't seem to believe that muscle can be a primary source of pain? And why do people believe it's just a secondary, you know, something else happens and then the muscle just reacts to that? And then so, pain. Well, we're not teaching it in undergraduate or postgraduate uh, medical training. There is a, a large amount of research on how muscle <clears throat> causes pain, but none of that is being taught. And one of the reasons is that there's no discipline that owns muscle. If you think like, where would muscle belong? You know, you would see, think maybe physical medicine and rehabilitation. It, it does, it's not there or in neurology, or in orthopedic surgery. We're not really looking at how specific muscle can cause pain. And we can see it in the electronic uh, database. So we know that we now uh, examine patients and put all the data into an electronic medical record. So we have access to that medical record uh, of 45 million patients. And that was a record that was accumulated by IBM when they made an effort to create a, a doctor assist uh, app called Watson. And it actually failed. They were unable to make it work and they sold this database to Accenture and Accenture uh, is working with me on a foundation. And they allowed us to query the database of 45 million patients. And we asked the database, how many muscles do you associate uh, in, the, in the medical record with shoulder pain, hip pain, knee pain, tennis elbow, low back pain. How many muscles are we finding in the electronic medical record? And the answer was zero. There are no muscles identified in the electronic medical record of 45 million patients when it came to their pain presentation because there's no template. You can't even record a muscle, if you thought a certain muscle was the cause of pain, you can't put it into the electronic or medical record. You could write a note, but you, there's no template to record that data. So it's as if it doesn't exist. It's blind to us. Um, next slide. You mentioned something earlier, and for those of our viewers and guests that are here, please, if you have a question, uh, write us a message through the chat. You, met, you mentioned something earlier called non-specific low back pain. And we, and we see that come up a lot. Is that is that a real diagnosis or just other healthcare providers and physicians just giving up on the source and saying, I don't know what's going on? It's, no, it's, it's, it's defined as sprains and strains of soft tissue. And it's the number one diagnosis. So but in a study of, of 23,000 patients done by Richard Dale, that 70 to 85% of the patients who presented with back pain had sprains and strains of soft tissue as but the reason for the back pain. It's not, it doesn't drill down or not granular to the point of which muscle is causing a problem. It's just some soft tissue is causing some symptom. Exactly, exactly. And Roger, did, 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 did I answer you? Uh, you know, probably not adequately because you yourself are, are interested in, you know, the muscles as a contributing factor so we're doing ground groundwork now. We're doing work that no one's ever done in terms of a comprehensive pain center looking at soft tissue as a contributing factor. We are changing medicine in doing this work that we're doing. No, and this is very important and, and has always been really a important area of interest for me, obviously as a surgeon, who really believes in minimal invasive spine surgery. And minimal invasive spine surgery is about protecting the muscle. I mean, the whole point of minimal invasive spine surgery is to 
do an operation, but trying to protect and preserve the muscle because we know that the muscle is important. You're extending it, uh, you know, your, 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 your viewpoint extends it to the, to the pre-op, I mean, as not, not only is it important to, to protect and preserve muscle, but muscle in itself can also be a primary source of pain. That's really the new thing that you bring to the table. I mean, you, not you personally, but, the, but, but your, uh, your philosophy and, and your research and the people that you work with. And, and I think that that's really a novel, a novel idea. And it is just like so many other things is you wonder why is it so novel? I mean, it's the biggest organ of, in the body. We, we, we know it's important. You know, the whole concept of minimal invasive spinal surgery is based on protecting muscle. Why can't we uh, put our, you know, why, why can't we understand this could also be a primary source of pain and it's totally overlooked. Right, it, it's, it's sort of complicated because when we examine muscles, we generally are just pressing on the muscle to find tenderness. And where we find tenderness may not be where the tenderness originates. So what I mean is everybody's got tenderness in their neck muscles, like you know, where their shoulder, the trapezius, but that pain that's in the trapezius may actually be coming from another muscle, the muscle that overlies the scapula, overlies the, sho the, the, the shoulder blade. That's the infraspinatus muscle. So we, we have a difficulty in identifying the actual source. And um, if we go a couple of slides down, this is the device that, um, that I developed that we're soon gonna have at the spine center. Uh, because we're building, we're building a couple of new devices uh, at Cornell, and we we will be able to actually assess individual muscles with this instrument. And what we're going to do is stimulate all the muscles in an area that we think are the possible source of pain, and um, most of them are going to feel nothing with this stimulation because the amount of stimulation we use is tiny. But in the muscle that's altered, that we call sensitized, the person will feel that we're pressing very hard or they're going to feel pain from this instrument. And that tells us that that muscle is a source of pain. So we, we, we will have a very specific scientific methodology to identify these, the muscles that are the reason for the pain. And we, we have then um, a target for treatment that we can use um, in a situation where a person had a successful spine surgery and still had pain afterwards, we will be able to identify uh, muscles if they are the source of pain by using this instrument. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And you know, I, this uh, message came into the chat about someone who had a successful spine surgery, still having symptoms. My question is one, where should we be thinking about muscle pain in our treatment algorithm? Are we thinking of it too late? Do we rule out some of the other pathologies first? And two, what would symptoms, what would patients be feeling if they really think it's a muscle problem versus a joint issue versus a nerve issue? Would that feel different in terms of symptomatology to the patient? Yes. So generally, if there's pain that's coming from a muscle, it'll be associated with some tenderness in that muscle. So if you feel pain in your low back and you press on your low back or on your buttock, that you'll feel uh, some difference from side to side. One side will feel uh, more tender than the other. Generally, it's also associated with a feeling of stiffness, that you feel you can't quite move as well on the side that's painful as on the other side that's not so painful. And the quality of pain, it sometimes feels like a toothache, like a deep aching pain. Uh, sometimes in contrast to uh, nerve pain, where we describe a burning sensation quite often, or pins and needles. Um, so the, the, the quality of the pain in a muscle is different. Um, it's also interesting that prolonged positioning makes it worse. So for example, if you were standing and you were feeling pain in your low back and you started to walk and felt better, that suggests that the pain is coming from muscle. Or if you were sitting for let's say a half hour or an hour, and you start to feel more pain, that prolonged positioning of a sensitized muscle makes it feel more pain. So we have certain telltale 
uh, findings that are suggestive of muscle pain. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in this picture? How are you actually figuring out what muscle is sensitized? And then once you do, then what are we prescribing to patients? What are some treatment so options? In, in this picture, you can see the screen which shows the uh, figure of the body. Um, and um, so there are a lot of muscles that are identified there. You, it's too small to see, but essentially in the shoulder, 16 muscles move the shoulder. Any one of those 16 muscles can be the source of pain in the shoulder. So frequently what we would do is get some imaging of the shoulder and we'd often see some tear in the rotator cuff. It could be a minor tear or a major tear. And we say, well, it's coming from the tear. But if we haven't examined the muscles in the shoulder, all 16 of them, we don't know if the pain is not coming from those muscles. So in this case here, I'm examining the pectoralis minor muscle, which is the muscle that's underneath the pectoralis major muscle. And I'm running this instrument from the origin of the muscle, which is the coracoid process, down onto ribs um, three, four, and five. So if, if I have sensitivity or, or tenderness along the course of that muscle from the origin to the insertion, I can say that that muscle is a source of pain in the shoulder. What, what do you look at on your screen there? Sorry. So the screen is really for, the, for teaching the clinician. So it would be, um, if, you, if you had the shoulder, it's a touch screen, you'll be able to touch the shoulder and a menu comes down of the 16 muscles. And then you can touch each muscle and a picture comes on the screen of that muscle and shows you where to place your device. And then the response of the patient is recorded in the software. And then you can switch over to treatment mode and then it'll show you where to do the injections in that muscle. Wow. Is this device that is like is commercially available or is this something that you designed it, only for your own It will only be available in my office and at a Cornell. Got it at the spine center. You know, we talk a lot about strengthening the muscles around the spine, especially pre-surgery, post-surgery, in terms of activity. So Dr. Hartle, you know, what are some of the things you tell patients in terms of activity, low back pain, how to, how to really prevent seeing us if, if they can? Well, we're so nice that why wouldn't people want to see us, right? <laughs> But, you know, I, I put this slide, this, this, this is my favorite slide in all of, of uh, spine medicine because it describes the relationship between activity or inactivity and pain and low back pain. And this is from a publication a number of years ago, but it basically shows you if you, if you look at the uh, intensity of activity, so that's working out, whatever it is you like to do, elliptical, biking, walking, and then on the y-axis going up and down, the risk of low back pain, you'll see that if you have a reasonable level of activity, so in the middle part of the curve, so it's all about moderation, right? If you, have, uh, if, if you do exercise, not too much, not too little, your risk of experiencing and suffering from low back or neck pain is the lowest. If you don't do anything, which is where a lot of people are, unfortunately, that increases your risk of pain, on the other hand, if you do too much, you can have injuries, sprains and injuries, and that can cause you pain as well. So it just, you know, it's, it's really common sense. And it's, it's what we're preaching in the spine center all the time. I certainly tell this to my patients after surgery at some point. I want you to walk. I want you to exercise, go in the pool, do the elliptical, do this, do that. Not too much, but also not too little. And this really goes back to muscle, you know, because like we like we discovered before, muscle can be a source of pain, but muscle can also then be a source of recovery and strengthening your your your, your health and, and avoiding pain if you treat it right. And that's where I think we skipped the slide. You know, Han, uh, Norman Marcus was going to talk about Hans Kraus, and that that was really once one of one one of his main messages, I think, to the public and to his patients was the importance of muscle and the importance of muscle as a source of pain, but then also as a means to recovery and to really get these patients back 
And here, I think this maybe maybe Norman wants to talk about this also as a source of diagnosis to see, you know, do people have sufficient muscle mass and uh, are there are their muscles sufficiently functional to prevent the, the 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 development of back pain? Because Hans Krauss did research on school children. I mean, Norman knows much better, and he found that uh, the school school children in this country were not adequately in shape and therefore had a much higher chance of developing low back pain. That was a, a very, very important study done many years ago. Maybe Norman, if you want right. to talk about that. So um, Dr. Krauss went to uh, Switzerland, um, Italy, and Austria, and he uh, examined uh, the, the children um, who were in, in grade school, and he gave them this test called the Krauss-Weber test. Uh, for trunk muscle strength and flexibility. And then he came back to the United States and gave the test uh, in the United States. And the European children uh, passed the test 95% of the time and the American children passed 50% of the time. And he brought this data to uh, President Eisenhower who was very alarmed and started the President's Council on Physical Fitness based on uh, Dr. Krauss's findings. And then Dr. Krauss uh, was in the White House once again under President Kennedy. When President Kennedy was being treated by another uh, physician, uh, Janet Travell, who was injecting him six times a day um, because she didn't make a distinction between a muscle that needed to be injected and a muscle that needed proper exercise. And she was asked to leave and Dr. Krauss took over and got Kennedy all better. And JFK was going to start a spine institute uh, when he was assassinated. So had he survived, had JFK survived, what we're talking about today would be standard of care. If we go back, um, Ricky, to the um, slides that speak about, and so here, um, if we go one more slide, this. So this is Hans Krauss's conceptual model of functional muscle pain. So he said that there are four reasons why muscles can cause pain. One is tension and stress. So we know that when people are nervous or they have a deadline, that quite often their pain can be worse. Deficiency, which we call deconditioning, which is weakness and or stiffness in, in your muscles. Spasm, which is an involuntary contraction. It's when your muscle sort of grabs you and, and you can't move easily without pain. And then the last are trigger points, which is altered muscle tissue, um, where the tissue becomes more sensitive to any stimulus. Because um, um, in order to, to feel discomfort in a muscle or anywhere in your body, you should need a strong stimulus. Like, you know, it has to be like a real hard uh, uh, impact or a cut, something like that. Whereas in a sensitized muscle, or in here it's being described as trigger points or someone with trigger points, all you need is a trivial kind of stimulus. Just a little pressure or a little movement is enough to cause the pain. So each one of these categories um, has a specific way of treating it. And um, when we, uh, we looked at the Krauss-Weber test, it tells us about deficiency, about weakness and or stiffness. And we let, let, let's, talk, let's talk about that a little bit as well. You know, when patients feel some of these muscle tensions or what they sometimes describe as knots in their shoulder region or tender points, how do you separate passive treatments like massage therapy, or trigger point injections versus active treatments like strengthening and stretching. How do you balance those for the patient? And how do you know which one is appropriate based on some of the symptoms they describe? Well, if you find on the cross rubber test that somebody fails, that means that they have weakness and or stiffness in their muscles. So if you have weakness and or stiffness, you would do the Krauss exercises that he developed at uh, Columbia um, in the late 50s by studying 3,700 patients for four and a half years and came up with 21 exercises that, um, that we can 
uh, treat patients at Cornell and in and, and my practice um, to, to overcome weakness and stiffness. If it's spasm, we have specific ways of using electrical stimulation to overcome episodes of spasm. If there are altered muscle tissue, we have various injection techniques. We also recognize that if somebody has pain that's a recent onset, we call it acute or subacute, that some of the things that we can provide can cure that person. Like we have a laser at Cornell um, that we can use. And for acute injuries, like many of the sports teams, professional sports teams have lasers that are specifically for pain. And, and so we can, we can do something like that. Or massage can be successful in eliminating the pain or, or starting somebody on simple exercise. But when the pain has been there for, for months or years in some cases, then we have a situation where we not only have a problem in the muscle itself, but we get a phenomena called central sensitization, which means that certain cells in your nervous system called microglia become stimulated and produce chemicals called cytokines that give us more pain and also alter our mood. And we wanna be aware that when we have pain, it can be coming from the muscle, it can be coming from a nerve being squeezed, but it can also be coming from microglia producing cytokines. And that pain is called nociplastic pain. So now we have three different types of pain, nociplastic, neuropathic, and nociceptive. And each one has a different approach. And when we talk about nociceptive and muscle, we have these four reasons for the pain. So we see it gets complicated and, and we need to- really It, it sounds like muscle pain isn't always just muscle pain, isn't always just muscle pain. It depends on the type of pain, where it's located, and then that kind of caters uh, some of the treatments that you suggest. Roger, you were, you were gonna say something. Yeah, I you know, it's fascinating. You mentioned with JFK that the doctor who was treating him first, she would just do injections six times a day. And she didn't yes. differentiate. So I think that's what you talked about, right? Uh, yes. As a, uh, as a modern uh, muscle uh, pain doctor, you have to be able to differentiate. How did Hans Krauss do that in those days? When he, how, how did he figure out that this muscle needs to be injected and that other muscle is deficient needs to be trained? Well, if you... If you fail the test, it means you need the exercise. So did JF JFK fail the test? Or, or Yes, absolutely. Horribly failed it. So even though everyone thought he was in great shape, he looked like tan and he was, had the football in his hand, and everyone thought, oh, this guy is really top notch. He wasn't. He was, in, he was totally deconditioned. Actually, when Hans first saw him, he had been in a wheelchair for six months uh, because he had planted a tree in Canada with the prime minister at the time, Diefenbaker, and he strained his back and was in acute spasm and didn't go away. But the press was kind enough to not show him in the wheelchair or on crutches. Um, and so he needed to be totally deconditioned. Um, he was uh, taught how to work out in the pool that they had in the White House basement and he was really getting better. And only when he was really much better in terms of tr trunk muscle strength and flexibility did he start to get a few injections. But that injections can't be the answer for every muscle pain that you have. It just doesn't make sense. But let's talk about that for a moment. You know, with, with JFK, he was receiving not just injections, but also steroid injections. And he was getting adrenal insufficiency. His body wasn't making steroids and that was causing weakness and a whole host of problems. When you identify some of these muscles that are quote sensitized on with your device, well, then what do you do? Is, does that mean it, it warrants an injection? And if so, what are you injecting? Or are you just needling and stimulating so, the muscle? So it turns out that um, if you want to look and see if, if what we're doing in medicine, whatever it is, if it's injections or surgery or what have you, there is a library called the Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews. And you can go in there and look at every study that's ever been done in the world on a specific problem and, and a specific treatment. So when, when we do that, we see that what you inject into a muscle doesn't matter. 
if you use Botox, if you use lidocaine, if you use saline, it just doesn't matter. It seems that the needle in the tissue appears to be the active ingredient. So this is why with dry needling, sometimes people get some improvement or with trigger point injections, people get improvement, but it really has to do with the needle in the tissue causing an inflammation from the trauma of the needle, bringing in blood supply, which gives you more oxygen and normalizes some of the biochemical milieu just from the needle in the tissue. The problem with that is that if you just go into a tender spot, you're missing the action. So why is that so? Any muscle that's a source of pain, the pain is originating in the beginning and the end of the muscle, not in the middle of the muscle, not the muscle belly. If you don't know which muscle is causing the pain, how can you know where the ends are? And if you don't treat the ends of the muscle, you will not get sustained profound relief. So the fact that muscles lie one on top of another and you press on a spot, you're pressing on a few layers at the same time. Which muscle in that layer is the source of pain? You don't know. And the other thing about muscles is that they radiate pain to adjacent muscles. That's what they do typically. So if you have pain in one muscle, you'll feel it in another muscle and that's called referred pain. And you don't know on the physical examination if you're examining the referred, the referred muscle or the actual source muscle. Uh, how, if you, go, go ahead, Roger. If you go back one slide, I, I had a question for Norman. You know, we, we put the slide in here and that's, that's a great study that was done many years ago at the uh, yes. I in New York, right? Um, and, but you know, we, we work with Master Yang Yang. I, I don't know if you uh, if you've been here. He's been on this uh, show a few times. He he is a Tai Chi master, and yes. we've been working with him on and off for for many years. And he just did a study where we had patients from the Spine Center offer the opportunity to partake in in some of his online but also in person Tai Chi classes. And he's working on a study for back pain. And uh, I just talked to him last weekend and he found in his prospective study that he's been doing for patients that Tai Chi is very effective in treating back pain. It's very beneficial for patients with back pain. Yes. I'm just wondering if this is kind of along those lines because Tai Chi, I mean, it has probably also a psychological component, the meditation part, but it also has a physical component in terms of strengthening the muscle. Do you think there may be a relationship here? Absolutely. So it, the important thing is that exercise can help. It needs to be the right kind of exercise. So Tai Chi has, you know, uh, hundreds, you know, thousands of years, you know, behind it. And it's been useful um, and it, uh, it helps mobilize a patient. It slowly increases their range of motion. And that's exactly what's going on with the cross exercises as well. Um, they're sort of the new guy on the block compared to Chinese medicine. But there, if we look closely at what one is doing with Tai Chi or what one is doing with uh, Hans's exercises, there'll be a similarity. But the, the answer as well is it doesn't treat everything. It treats patients who have muscle deficiency or deconditioning. Right. So, if there's altered muscle tissue or there's nociplastic pain where the um, microglia are stimulated and we have increased cytokine, we need to address all of it. So, th but it's very important that we can have some intervention like Tai Chi, which could be very effective and, and not costly and, and not um, you know, potentially dangerous for a patient. Right. Well, that's great. I, uh, I put this slide in here because one of the purposes of the Spine Center and one of the ideas behind bringing in specialties from different areas in medicine to treat patients with, with back and neck issues and uh, spinal problems is obviously to maximize our understanding, but also our success rate for patients. And for me as a surgeon, it's been an incredible 
pleasure and honor really to work with Dr. Marcus because again, it, 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 you know, the muscle is something that, that I as a minimum invasive spine surgeon take very, very seriously. That's at the core of, of minimum invasive spine surgery, protection of the muscle. And we published this book last year. Uh, it's really one of the most comprehensive books now that summarizes our current knowledge. Thank you, Ricky. <laughs> that summarize our current knowledge in minimum invasive spine surgery. And I was especially really honored to have Dr. Marcus contribute with a chapter, which you would think for a surgical book may not be relevant, but I thought it was very important to really have somebody talk about the importance of muscle because it is so important for minimum invasive spine surgery, not only for the procedure, but also for understanding before surgery and after surgery, where could the pain be coming from? And over the years, I've, I've shared a number of, a significant number of patients with Dr. Marcus who had very successful spine surgery, but still had muscle-related pain postoperatively. And Norman Marcus, myself, we've had a number of success stories in, in patients who saw him, worked with him, and then got rid of not only the surgical pain, but also the muscle pain that was laid over the original surgical reason why they had an operation. So, so, so this was, for me, was a really, really great experience. And thanks again, Dr. Marcus, uh, to contributing to the book. And this, this image here just shows you where the different areas of uh, pain, you know, where pain can come from, you know, radicular, which is nerve root compression, mechanical, which is instability. There are all these reasons why people can have back uh, pain, uh, but myogenic or muscle pain is, is the yellow portion. Is, is certainly a very significant part of that. But if you don't look for it, you don't, you're, you're not gonna find it. You know, I think one of, the, one of the challenges for us and when we start thinking about muscle pain, most of our diagnoses are sometimes created in reverse, meaning we have treatments and then we look for diagnoses that can be treated by such treatments. You know, we have surgeries, we have epidural steroid injections, we have ablations, we have a bunch of nice, fancy, innovative things. And then we try to find the source on the patient to fit into that box. And sometimes it doesn't. And for that reason, then we start exploring things, quote, outside the box, even though muscle pain shouldn't be outside the box. And I think we have done a really nice job with the help of Dr. Marcus kind of being part of our spine team here to really refocus, like, what is the source of the pain? Let's fix that so you don't need some of these sexy interventions like MIS surgery or epidurals and spinal cord stimulators and things like that. Um, Dr. Marcus, you know, I think we answered a lot of the questions here. You know, we're lucky actually, um, Dr. Yang Yang is actually on this with us. Uh, so he's been listening intently and contributing uh, in our chat. So it's nice to have him here as well. But just, uh, I wanted to let you talk a little bit about this foundation in terms of muscle pain education. Uh, what is this uh, foundation? What are they looking to achieve and how can people help? So. Since nobody owns muscle, and it's really not being taught in terms of the why do muscles cause pain? I mean, what happens on a cellular level? That should really be part of the medical education that all doctors get before they graduate and, and in their fellowship training. So the foundation's mission is to change um, medical education so that it includes muscle uh, muscle pain and. And, and the pathophysiology of muscles, meaning what, what goes wrong in a muscle that ends up in the muscle being the source of pain. Um, so we are, we are raising money and um, we are trying to uh, influence, uh, for example, the electronic medical record. We're trying to get into discussions with Epic so that they change their template so that we'll have a place to put specific muscles in there and actually be able to identify muscles when we mine data. Um, we're trying to uh, fund uh, full day seminars on all of the aspects of muscle pain from the basic research, uh, preclinical research, translational research into how does some finding um, in, uh, in a bench research, an animal model gets translated into a potential source of treatment and then head to head treatments to see what's the best approach for various muscle pain. Um, we've created an award uh, this year called the Hans Krauss Award for Excellence in Muscle Pain Education. 
And Dr. Hartle was the first recipient of the award. And we were really proud to have him because he's doing something that no one's ever done before. Just as he uh, uh, edited a, a book and published a book on spine surgery, it's the first book to include muscle as a source of pain in minimally invasive spine surgery. Um, and we, we want to expand on that. We want to uh, have our fellows at Cornell trained in how to properly examine a patient and then to come up with these various diagnoses. And then of course, we want this knowledge to be disseminated amongst other uh, centers, other academic groups, so that it becomes a standard of care. Right now, we are a black swan. Um, you know, we're doing something that nobody else is doing. It's hard to believe that there is no other center that is incorporating muscle as a standard of their protocols to evaluate and treat patients. And uh, I, think it's, I think we're really fortunate to have, you know, the comprehensive approach that we have here at Walker in New York Presby. You know, it's interesting you told us about Dr. Hartle's award. When he was mentioning it to me, he said he was the muscle physician of the year. And I think I kind of understood it a little differently than how you're explaining it as the muscle educator of the year. Uh, but again, thank you, Dr. Marcus, for sharing your expertise and Dr. Hartle, of course, um, for everything you do with MIS and including muscle education in your book. Uh, for the rest of you out there, thank you for joining us on our spine time. You know, you know, the pandemic is hopefully narrowing its scope and a lot of our in-person seminars and conferences have reopened. So for that reason, we have decided to transition this Spine Time webinar to a monthly series. Um, we love doing this. We love having you guys join us and speaking on topics of interest to you. Um, we just have, unfortunately, a, we're getting pulled in a lot of directions for in-person seminars and symposiums. Uh, so we will, we still want to bring this to you guys. If you have topics you want to hear about, please email us so we can create and uh, get the speakers uh, to help you. Uh, so we'll be going monthly in June. Uh, those topics are to be determined. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. Marcus. Thank you, Dr. Hartle, for joining us. And to all of our guests, we've got your back here at the Spine Time webinar series. And good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.